Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Invasive Species Awareness Week webinar series hosted by the Southern IPM Center and sponsored by the University of Florida, Texas AgriLife Extension, Auburn University, and University of Georgia's Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. Today we are proud to present Russ Mizell and the topic of Bermuda Stemgrass Maggot Monitoring and Management and Tabana Trapping. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this talk will primarily focus on Bermuda grass stem maggot, but it's part of a larger program that was funded through NIFA for uh, extension last year in uh, livestock production. Uh, here on this first slide, you can see the individuals that are involved at the University of Florida. I have a couple of animal scientists here, a couple of of um, <clears throat> county agents and some other people that are uh, also part of it, at least ex officio, fixio. And Lisa Garcia is my assistant, who is really the boots on the ground for this project. Uh, really, uh, it's, it's a two year program <clears throat> through Norm Lepla, who is the University of Florida IPM facilitator. And it's primarily extension and demonstration, and we have to do a little bit of research. <clears throat> the number one focus of it is the Bermuda grass stem maggot, and because I had some um, previous experience in developing traps for tabanids, I put that in there also as a as a project. So <clears throat> now, what is we had also uh, we we gathered up a uh, quite a few people that to cooperate with us in this project to help us find populations of Bermuda grass stem maggot and those are listed here. Tim Wilson, who's a county extension director down in Bradford County, Florida, was very instrumental in helping us out last year. He found the first big infestation. So the. Project objectives are to look at the emergence phenology of Bermuda grass stem maggot. It actually uh, overwinters in the soil. We wanted to understand uh, when it emerged uh, by on a latitudinal basis. We were looking to enhance the sampling methods that were available if that was possible. We have a fairly uh, wide range of uh, Bermuda grass culture in Florida from north to south and we're interested in what was going on at different scales and then we were hoping to take advantage of any opportunities that came along and to try to tease out new behavior biology ecology and uh, of course we have a new uh, grass breeder at the University of Florida who's interested in looking at cultivar susceptibility. So most of what we know about the Bermuda grass stem maggot was developed by a scientist at the University of Georgia in 2011, 2012, and 13. And uh, the information that I'm going to present will come from that, and so will the pictures. Uh, it's a background, and so the Bermuda grass stem maggot is a scientific name, uh, Atherogona reversera, reversera, and it's from Central and Southeast Asia. It was first seen 2010 in California. It's now spread over most of the Southeast, and it's also known from Hawaii. It is an invasive fly pest of, on Bermuda grass, which is the Cynodon species. Also, another other, a number of other species uh, attacked as well. Infest most all the varieties, but it does prefer thinner stems like uh, the common or Alicia uh, varieties. And on the bottom of this figure, you can see the the adults and also the larvae and the damage, which I'll show you some more of here. If I can get my these are these these are the adult flies. They're fairly small. They're about two millimeters or so, uh, not really that big, uh, hard to see. They actually lay their eggs on the leaves 
and the larvae then bore into the developing stems. They hit the first node and, and uh, feed on the sap and the tissue. Then they uh, pupate in the soil. They have a orange to dark red puparia. They takes them about 12 to 21 days, and they live about four to five weeks. So uh, the damage is fairly easy to see as it builds up. It's not uh, <clears throat> not too hard to find, and it can build up very quickly. But the trouble is that uh, it resembles a lot of other problems of grass, so you really have to uh, dissect the stems in order to make sure that you have the infestation and not something else. As you can see in the upper left here, it can turn the field brown very quickly. And the other two uh, slides here show you what the damage actually looks like and the part of the plant that they hit. Bermuda grass is an important crop in Florida because of, of uh, its value to the horse industry. They really like the uh, quality of the hay, and so it gets a premium uh, when it's sold. So right now, based on what we know, what's been learned at the University of Georgia, and also what's known about a related species, the sorghum shoot fly, is you scout the fields for the damaged stems. Uh, people can use a sweep net to gather the adults, but we don't have a threshold, so we, we, that information is interesting, but it doesn't help us a lot. So if you have an infestation, then basically what you're looking at is what stage the crop is in, because the easiest thing to do is to harvest the hay before it really gets damaged. So if you're at a point, if your crop is at a point where you can do that, then that's the optimum thing to do. Otherwise, uh, you're going to try to protect it until it does get to the stage where you can harvest it. And so you're going to have to spray with a pyrethroid insecticide. And what happens is the, the flies that aren't killed, they basically leave the field. And as the, as the hay then regrow, uh, re, regrows, then you're going to have uh, flies coming back in and reinfesting the crop. So it's a continuous process. It is a, a tropical insect. Uh, and based on what was known in 2013, which is our best year, it, it started in central Florida and showed up in uh, popula reasonable populations that were important enough to, to try to manage in mid-June. And then, as you can see, in south Georgia, early July, middle, middle Georgia, mid-July, and north Georgia, north later July. So that was 2013. 2014 was a lot different than that. Oh, what we were trying to do is, is monitor the thing and get ahead of it so that we could inform people to when to expect it and, and what kind of populations they might expect. But when we started in early February, south of Gainesville, at, at, this is a University of Florida uh, research farm at Citra. It's about 30 miles south of Gainesville. And we were sampling there and all around to uh, try to come up with this information with the idea that uh, we would put this on the website to to get people to uh, uh, be able to use the information. And we also, in part of that website, is we developed a survey for the producers to sample their own places and let us know if, the, if anybody found any populations, and so that we could get the get the word out in real time with the idea that eventually we would develop something for a field day to help people better understand what was going on with this pest. So we did develop a website, and it's up and running uh, to explain the, the biology and ecology of the insect, as far as we know. And uh, Lisa is responsible for this. The survey was attached to that. And one of the interesting things that we did, which I'm going to uh, point out down here at the bottom is the source of this idea. 
It's by Signori et al. in 2014. It's titled Wikipedia as a Tool for Disseminating Knowledge of Agrobiodiversity. It was in Hort Tech, uh, 24 pages 118 to 126. And again, uh, Lisa did this, but basically uh, the point of Wikipedia is, is that in this publication, uh, they say that by developing a Wikipedia article and then linking your website to that article, you get a whole different uh, group of people utilizing your websites and learning about whatever it is you're trying to uh, transmit to them. So this basically enhances the traffic on your website and, and it indicates, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, increases the the uh, traffic to your uh, central website. So uh, it looks like it's done that for us and, and it looks like a really good tool that I just stumbled on one day, just picked up a, a pub and saw in there and that's what we did. So I think it has uh, a lot of potential. Uh, Lisa's also a, a tweet, she's into tweeting, so she developed this this particular function of the website and that was another way that we could interest people in what we were doing and, and get the word out. So we didn't get a whole lot of folks interested but we did get some. And part of that was, as, we, uh, as you can tell, we didn't really see that many flies so it wasn't a big deal. The other things we tried to do were, were to develop some new traps. Uh, the cone emergence cage here on the left is, is a common one used with soil insects, just whatever's underneath the screen cage get, comes out and goes up into the top and you collect them. I've developed a lot of traps over my career and so this was just something I developed one day to, to test. Uh, and this is another version of it where you can look at different colors and what have you uh, in a hay field. Uh, we also tried sticky traps. Uh, we, we knew that sweet nets did work, but again, we don't have a threshold for this insect, and so uh, we're just looking for something else that w we could put out that wouldn't require boots on the ground every day to, to monitor things. So we did, we did uh, as part of the project, uh, participate in local uh, field days, and uh, so all that being said, and despite the fact that the Bermuda grass stem maggot was a huge pest in 2013, in 2014 it wasn't really a big deal. There were only a few places where we really found uh, high populations and it was, certainly was not widespread. So uh, they were very low. So, you know, why is that, why did that happen? And the first thing is it's a tropical insect. And so one might ask as entomologists, well, what, what do we know about uh, the life cycles of insects relative to the obvious, which would be temperatures? And so the first thing we did is we looked at the, as I remember now, we're talking about December, or um, I'm sorry, we're talking about the year 2013 when the populations were high. And if you so, if you look at December to June 2012, you can see the the temperature, the average temperatures were fairly moderate. And then if you look at the average temperatures in, and this was this was in in places all the way from Alachua County to, or actually from Citra to uh, Quincy, Florida. So you're talking about. Uh, approximately 200 miles, somewhere 150, 200 miles as the crow flies in latitude, a difference between the sites. So again, in, in December 12, December 2012 to June 2013, you can see again the average temperatures were uh, fairly moderate. If you go to uh, the low temperature extremes from December 2012 to June 2013, and this is the year when we had the high populations, you can see that there were some lower temperatures. We had, had temperatures in a couple of places that were in the uh, mid-20s or so. If you look at this, 
the average temperatures on December 13th to June 14, which is the year that we're sampling last year, you can see the average temperatures are, are again lower than the other ones from 2012 and 13, but fairly modest. But when you look at the extreme temperatures from December 2013 to June 2014, you can see that there were some much, much lower extremes and temperatures. And if you compare those, you can see that from 2013 on the left to 2000 on the four, 2014 on the right, it uh, was quite a bit colder in the extremes. And uh, whether that's the the reason for what we observed, of course we don't know, but it's a pretty good guess and, and supports what we think and also the experience that we have with other uh, insects that behave in similar ways. One of those, one group of those is the well-known uh, moths that overwinter in limited areas in the southeast. The screw worm fly is another one. But probably the most famous one is the fall army, excuse me, fall army worm that uh, Spidoptera fugipirida, and that one every year, uh, uh, its distribution ex uh, contracts to wherever the the line of demarcation is, the iso line where uh, the freezing temperatures occurred, and on average, that's a about this orange line here in Seminole County, about 27 degrees. So every year, the the uh, and and some years the army worm is completely frozen out of the continental United States. But this is a huge pest in many years, and it's right there uh, with uh, this. I mean, it's in the same habitat as the Bermuda grass stem maggot is. And each year, it expands its range all the way up as far as Canada on in many years. And so, it's it it even though it it starts off the season uh, in a in a small area in central South Florida, oftentimes it can it can uh, expand its distribution over most of the United States within that that year. So, we know that these pests are affected by temperature extremes and they can be exploited both to understand uh, what's going on and also to better manage pests. So this is all about uh, the term for this is phenology which is uh, predicting the key events in population dynamics. It's, it's uh, a very useful tool. And so I'm going to wind up the seminar by explaining uh, some of the things that are important relative to understanding the timing of the biological events of an organism. And two, two good examples here that are important that are easy to understand is that pollinators like bees have to, have to uh, time their activity to wide the flowers, and those flowers can change their their bloom periods in time and space on a latitudinal basis or at the landscape level. And of course, uh, with global warming, there's a lot of observations on various species already in birds, where the the local uh, weather and climate have changed the the uh, coincidence of time between the birds and the food that's that they normally use because the local the local uh, temperatures either uh, are not the same as this the origin of the birds or the insects have, have not arrived when when they need them or they're too yeah, they get there too late so uh, this, is, this is a very important uh, phenomenon to, to uh, both understand and and use. So, phenology is nothing more than the seasonal occurrence or abundance of an organism, and that can be by life or little cycle or growth stage. And certainly, uh, many herbivores are related to their host plant stage for the, the, their food. There are a lot of of uh, 
moths or butterflies that must time their emergence from their eggs at specific times, say early in the season when the leaves are still tender so that they're, they're able to bite them and to digest them before the defenses of the, of the trees kick in. So it's very important and, and in many cases it's down to just a few days. Can Either way can uh, be critical. So we, we try to exploit this phenology either uh, to predict the timing of the events in an organism's development. And since temperature is the driving variable of cold-blooded insects or cold-blooded animals, and insects being one, uh, we can use that. So. What drives the phenology then is temperature and photoperiod, uh, and then obviously the climate and weather extremes can be important as well. Now one of the ways you can, is probably very familiar with most people, is that we have these plant hardiness zones set up which are related to the minimum temperature range for a particular location over time and you can see that in, in Georgia they have five different plant hardiness zones and in Florida we have uh, seven and you can see interestingly enough that they're not exactly uh, straight on in coincidence or congruence with, with the latitude and that just tells you that they're being influenced by other variables that uh, affect temperature extremes. So that's important from understanding what kind of plants or can survive in a particular area, the, the diversity, that sort of thing. Uh, it's also important because of chilling hours which relate to the planting uh, selection and planting of fruit cultivars and, and, and other crops in uh, in uh, Florida and other areas of the southeast uh, because the, the, the phenological events of blooming and fruiting and such are related to the number of chilling hours below 45 degrees uh, for plants and you can see that in Florida we have a, a quite a variation in chilling hours from south to north, so plant breeders have to take this into consideration when they're when they're breeding plants to fit a particular location. And so you can see that here, where on the left, that peach cultivars are uh, are released that have certain required chilling hours, and so. Uh, this is the reason why we get a, a, a people from, say, uh, New Jersey come move down to Florida and they want to bring their favorite fruit trees with them and plant them and then they, they can't figure out why they don't get any fruit and uh, so this is, this is the root of that. So I'm not going to belabor this point but basically we know that uh, with with insects, arthropods in general, there's a developmental rate in response to temperature. There's a low threshold. There's a high threshold. If it gets too low, nothing happens. If it gets too high, it can be lethal. And that curve is, it does have a, a linear uh, part of it, but it, it's a kind of an S-shaped S -shaped curve for, for most species. Now, when you're trying to predict events, and you start looking at emergence, which is what we're what we're talking about here, the the occurrence of a phenological event. Uh, one of the things that I've done that's uh, very interesting over I've been with in my current job for about 30 years, and I've sampled a lot of insects over time, and what you find out is is that the emergence from year to year can vary considerably. And that's what that's what we're trying to predict. So this is just an example of the nutcase bear. This is a, a male 
pheromone trap catch using use uh, strictly for males and it's in pecan and so this is 95 96 97 98 99 and so if you look down here and see when the first emergence was you can see that wow there's a difference here this one the first year in 1997 it was before April 10th here the first emergence didn't occur till May 10th this one was the end of April this one was toward the end of April and so in five years and I've got about 15 years of this data which which is uh, expands this but basically this shows you that there's about a four to seven week window here and when the uh, various biological events take place this one happens to be the emergence of the nutcase bear males so if you were going to set up a management scheme and you were you were not monitoring this thing and say you you just decided to start spraying on the middle of March to be safe and so you sprayed every 10 to 14 days you're gonna on the, on this particular year in 1999 by the time the insects were even present you would have already sprayed four or five times wasting your money and on this year you would have been closer so this this points to the importance of all this information it also points to the importance of having a sampling method a monitoring method for these species in order to make uh, integrated pest management decisions and prime prime uh, the the, uh, the best depiction of this type of thing on a national basis and I believe that this is the only data available of this kind that I'm aware of anyway this is from a publication of Snow et al back in the late 80s which I was a part of it's basically uh, looking at the great root bore emergence which is a it's a clear wing moth sesiid and again it's a male emergence using pheromone traps and so we have the south on the top and the north on the bottom and that's Kalamazoo Michigan at the very bottom and this is um, basically right outside Tallahassee in uh, North Florida so you're looking at the breadth of the United States more or less and so if you start at the bottom and look up you're talking about the first emergence in end of the June or so and as you go north that shift or south I'm sorry that shifts in time but it also as you go south you start to see uh, a very uh, sporadic uh, emergence and you also start to see more than one generation a year so I think this this really uh, depicts the importance of understanding phenology and how climate and weather can affect uh, insect populations and other organisms as well and basically anybody talking about uh, global warming or climate change uh, this is what the template this is the template that it's operating on so I will uh, stop there and and take questions uh, after this summary and that is uh, just remember that temperature is a driving variable in arthropod populations the extremes can be very important it changes with latitude and one thing I didn't mention is that uh, not just the pests are being affected by this but also the the pest natural enemies and oftentimes natural enemies may not be the effects the pests are and so uh, if we get big freezes and all the or we get freezes enough to kill the natural enemies and the pest can survive then you're going to get big populations uh, if, if uh, you don't get low temperatures then uh, the natural enemies continue to work and you have uh, the pest population start at it at very low levels in the season and that's one of the reasons why it takes them a while for them to build up so having said all this I think uh, the the experience and the information that we have 
points to the fact that brown, uh, Bermuda grass stem macket as an invasive species is a good case in point for what we're looking at here. And I will end by pointing out that there is a national phenological network where people actually contribute information. This is a sort of a, a crowd thing. Uh, and it has a lot of good information on, on plants and, and other uh, phenological phenomena that people can, can uh, use and diagnose. I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar as part of National Invasive Species Awareness Week. This recording and others from this series will be available at youtube.com slash southern IPM center.